As you mentioned, we're entering into a, a new series uh, here. And the series is going to cover both Esther and Ruth. And it's going to take us all the way up to Advent. And the title of this series is called Faithful Presence. Faithful Presence. And what we're going to be seeing here is ultimately the faithful presence of God with His people and for His people. That's going to be a little easier to see in Ruth than it is in Esther. Esther, I will be honest with you, is not an easy book to navigate through. All right, so we just did Habakkuk and Philemon. Um, these are books that are often overlooked as well. Well, so is Esther for many different reasons. Uh, for the first 700 years of the church, not a single commentary was written on the book of Esther. And John Calvin and Martin Luther, the great reformers, refused to preach on it. Well, they refused. They just never preached on Esther at all in their time. Esther never mentions the word of God at all in there, in the book. However, his presence, his faithful presence, permeates all throughout the book. And the way that we are going to see that is by understanding the bigger story. So in some ways, I'm going to help us learn how to read the Bible. I have a reminder to myself how to read the Bible. Is that in order to understand Esther, you've got to understand the bigger story of the Bible as well that Esther finds herself in. All right? And without understanding some of the context, some of the bigger story that Esther and Mordecai and Haman and King Xerxes find themselves in, we're going to have a really difficult time navigating the good news of the book of Esther and go to places where we really do not want to go. So let me give you a little bit of uh, background on the, the context of the book of Esther. We'll be doing this as we go through this series um, as, as well. This is right around 485 B.C. We decided to go with Esther before Ruth because Esther is closer to the storyline of Habakkuk that we just got out of. Remember, Habakkuk was about the northern kingdom of, 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 of the state, some kind of Judah, and God's prophecy toward them that they were going to be overrun and judged and by the Babylonians, that were going to come in and destroy them. All right? So that has happened. That didn't happen. That only took another dozen years or so ahead, or 20 years or so. And the Babylonians came in and wiped out the southern kingdom. All right, but he also told Habakkuk, hey, don't worry, they're going to get judged too. Seventy years later, another country is going to come and wipe out the Babylonians. Well, guess who that is? The Persians. All right, and that is the story, that is the setting we find ourselves in. So it's a little over 100 years later from Habakkuk. And two judgments have already taken place over southern Israel, um, Judah, that is, and then also of Babylon as well. All right, so Persian rule, they own the world, so to speak, the known world. Um, the king there is Asuserus, which I have a hard time saying, so I'm going to go with the Greek word Xerxes for it, which most people know him by anyways. Um, so when you see King Ahasuerus in your text, um, the Greek word for that is Xerxes, and so I'm going to be using the word Xerxes uh, in the text. Um, prior to this, King Cyrus, a, a Persian king, allowed the Jews that were taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians prior, allowed them to go back home. In other words, they were no longer in captivity, according to the Babylonians. They were still being over, uh, um, had authority of the Persians over top of them, so they weren't free in that sense, but they were free to go back home, back to Jerusalem, back to their temple, rebuild the temple, rebuild the wall. That's Ezra and Nehemiah, by the way, contemporaries of this. All right. For whatever reason, Esther and Mordecai do not go back. They stay in Persia. We're not told why, but if we stayed in a place, it's usually because we found it pretty comfortable and a place that we wanted to, to stay in. So it's likely that Esther and Mordecai found Persia to be not such a bad place to live, even though it wasn't Judah or Jerusalem or the temple. Possible speculation, conjecture. We don't know. All we know is that they're in Persia. 
And we're going to see that despite being in Persia, it seems like they've assimilated some of their ways, but they're still distinct. They still have their Jewish identity, although they, they hide that from folks. We're going to see later in the story that um, Haman recognizes them as Jews by their actions and what they are doing. So they're still living out Jewish kind of ways in this format. So I said there's no mention of God in the story, but he permeates the whole thing once we understand the bigger story that this is in. All right, so that's a little bit of what's going on here. Just to give you a visual here, um, on the left-hand side of the screen, in the orange there, that's Elam. That's uh, the center of uh, the Persian territory. I don't know if you can see that, but right above the E for Elam, it says Susa. That's where this story is taking place. That's the capital of the Persian Empire. This is modern-day Iran. Okay? And you can actually go there, if you want, and you can see the ruins of Susa that go back to the time of Esther and Mordecai. Now, what's in the background there is, is not from that time, but what's in the front there is some of the foundations and walls from that time. So it's pretty cool that you can go back there and actually see some of the stuff that is, is going on there. All right, so that in mind, we're going to read through Esther. All right, so this morning, it's kind of a, it's a long read. All right, it's a story. It's a narrative. This is the way that this is laid out. It's not doctrinally laid out or a short prayer like Habakkuk was. You know, this is a story being told. So I invite you really just to sit back, maybe even close your eyes and just listen to, to the story. If you need to see the visual, it'll be on the screen um, behind me here. But I'm just going to read through the first two chapters. I'm going to pray, and we're going to briefly dive into these first two chapters this morning. Because we're going to have four more weeks in Esther as well. Now, in the days of Xerxes, the Xerxes who reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces, provinces, in those days when King Xerxes sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were, provinces were before him. While he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days. 180 days happier. So what you're going to be seeing here is the opulence and the abundance and the splendor and the glory of this king. All right, it's going to be opposed to the bigger story that's going on, and even some of the, the smaller characters in here as well. And when these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in Susa, the citadel, both great and small, a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. So this extends to everybody now, a general feast that all people are invited to. There were white cotton curtains and violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rods and marble uh, pillars and also couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, uh, porphyry marble, mother of pearl and precious stones. Drinks were served in golden vessels, vessels of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king, and drinking was according to to this evening, there is no compulsion. <laughs> In other words, drink as much as you want, however much you want, whatever you want. That's the kind of party this was for seven days from the best wine. For the king had given orders to all the staff of his palace to do as each man desired. Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to King Xerxes. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry, in other words, he was drunker than a scum, with wine. He commanded Mahuman, Dista, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abgabda, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Xerxes, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown, in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, delivered by the eunuchs. At this, the king became enraged, and his anger burned within him. Then the king said to the wise men who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in law and judgment. The men next to him, Ian Karshina, Shithar, 
and Matha, Tarshish, Meres, Marcina, and Mamukin, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who saw the king's face and sat first in the kingdom. According to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti? Because she has not performed the command of King Xerxes delivered by the eunuchs. Then Mamukin said in the presence of the king and the officials, not only against the king has Queen Vashti been wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples who are in the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the Persian media who have heard of the queen's behavior will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath and plenty. If it pleases the king, let a royal order go out from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it may not be repealed, that Vashti is never again to come before King Xerxes. And let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, for it is vast, all women should give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. This advice pleased the king and the princes, and the king did as the Mukin proposed. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, and to every people in its own language, that every man be master in his own household and speak according to the language of his people. After these things, when the anger of King Xerxes had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa the citadel under custody of Haggai, the king's unit, who was in charge of all the women. Let their cosmetics be given them, and let the young women who pleases the king be queen instead of Ashley. This pleased the king, and he did so. Now, there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjamite. But been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is, Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother, means that they're cousins with one another. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at, and when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Pegai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Pegai, who had charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor, and he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food, and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Now, when the turn came for each young woman to go into King Xerxes, after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil and myrrh, and six months with spices and ointments for women. When the young woman went in to the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go in, and in the morning, she returned to the second harem in custody, custody of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her, and she was summoned by name. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abigail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter, to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And when Esther was taken to King Xerxes into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Hebeth, the seventh year of the reign, 
The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Ashton. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. Now, when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred of her people as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigtham and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Xerxes. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Heavenly Father, as we take a look at this story, May your Holy Spirit open our eyes and our hearts to the bigger story that is going on as well, that we might, too, be changed and grow because of your faithful presence. In Jesus' name we pray to say amen. So, quite the story, right? This is a story that's fit for Hollywood in many kind of ways. All right, so you can see why a lot of commentaries did not want to comment on it and why some did not want to preach on it as well. Now, one of the things um, I do uh, each morning is this. I take a look at the, the feeds of the news feeds that are going on. And these are the ones I look at. I don't look at just one. I look at um, these four in the middle, and then there's the fifth kind of one that's ubiquitous all over the place. So CNN and, and Fox, you got left and, and right. Um, you got NPR and the other one there is all sides. Those are supposed to be neutral, kind of central ones. Not left, not right, trying to bring you the news straight down the middle. They can't do that. They do a fairly decent job, but they end up going one way or the other. Then you have, of course, Hollywood um, in control of a lot of media. And what all these things have in common is that they're telling story, and they're telling story from a particular perspective, right? They're, they're shaping the people who watch and listen and read in a certain way. CNN is shaping people to the left. It's fascinating to look at CNN's feed, and then look at Fox's feed immediately after that, and then look at NPR and all sides right after that. And there's patterns that you'll see right away. That CNN focuses on Trump and everything negative about Trump, trying to undermine everything that is going on there. Focusing in on climate change and gun control. Every day, you'll see something in the, the things on it. All the times, it's just ubiquitous. Fox, you go there, and all you hear is about Hunter Biden and Biden and all his mishaps and blunders and missteps. And the defunded cities, um, police cities, of where things are going bad. Same story, same trope, over and over again. When you watch it, you know they're trying to shape you toward the left, shape you toward the right. Because they don't tell you about the other stuff going on. They don't use the words that are going to affirm the other side, just their side. And to take down the other side. I share this because stories are powerful. Whether we like it or not, they shape us for better or for worse. This is what the power stories is. That's why they share stories from a particular perspective. Because they're trying to shape people toward a certain side. And they understand whoever's got power has the power to control the story. Because they know short story forms. Right? But there's two kinds of formation. U formation means good formation. We would say that is in line with what is righteous or what is right before God as he dictates what's good and true and beautiful. And malformation, that which is against the kingdom of God, that which is anti 
kingdom or anti-Christ. Right. So take a listen to some of these quotes. Real quickly, I'm going to go through these about the power of story. It's from Greg Bartholomew and Michael Bowie in their book. There are great variety of stories. Some merely entertain us. Others teach what is right and good or warn us of danger and evil. But there are also stories that are basic or foundational. They provide us with an understanding of our whole world and of our own place within it. We call that kind of a worldview story. And that's what I'm talking about when I say a bigger story. A story that answers the questions of life. Who am I? Who is God? What's wrong? Why am I here? How do I overcome? What's coming in the future? That's the bigger story. Alistair McIntyre says, I can only answer the question, what am I to do, if I can answer the prior question, of what story do I found myself a part of? Every athlete knows this. All right? Football players take on the football story. All right? They don't take on a baseball story. All right? The baseball story would not lead a football player in the right path to be a football player. Football players do things different than baseball players do. So the story shapes things and it tells you things about how you are to be in this story, how to work and how to live in this story. N.T. Wright says, Jesus' stories, people say, were just earthly stories with heavenly meaning. I'm like, but that's rubbish. Stories are far more powerful than that. Stories create worlds. Tell the story differently and you can change the world. And that's exactly what CNN and Fox and Hollywood are trying to do. They're trying to change the world toward that point of view. But so is scripture, in a way, that's telling the big story. But it's orientated, not left, not right, but toward the kingdom of God. All right? So this is where we're going with, with that. Eugene Peterson says, the Bible has the shape of a story. That is an immense, sprawling, capacious narrative. It functions as the authoritative word of God for us when it becomes the one basic story through which we understand our own experience and thought and the foundation upon which we base our decisions and our actions. In other words, it becomes your central story, your guiding story, the story that shapes you because it's telling you who you are, your identity, and how you're to act in this world, what's right. According to God and according to Scripture. Not what the left's telling us, right? Not telling the right telling us, right? Or any other authority trying to tell you what's right. But what Scripture's telling us what's right. And when we better need that, then it becomes the central story for us. So here it is. We all live story lives. To be human means to have a story and to live a story life. There's multiple layers to stories. Literally, each one of us has tens of thousands of stories. And we'll have a master story over that, trying to make sense of all those stories coming from all these different kind of places. Otherwise, we're just going to become kind of schizophrenic going all over from all these different voices uh, going on. So, according to Scripture and what it means to be a follower of Christ, we're to be gospel story. And we know this. The gospel story of Jesus Christ, the good news stories of Jesus Christ, God's redemptive story, his redeeming story, his saving story is the central story that we hold to. It's at the core of our being. It's like that red bullseye or that dot in the middle. And that every other story is seen through that story. Right? And there's multiple layers to all the stories that but the gospel story, the kingdom story, the biblical story is a story from which all other stories are defined and get their meaning and understanding from. That's what we, that's what we talk about when the gospel is centered. That we believe by faith who God is and his word becomes authoritative for us. That's what it means. So the flip side of this is all these story-isms that are out here. I'm just going to contrast the gospel story to these other stories ways that we can become formed and deformed, not in the image of Christ. Isms. Okay, racism. Race is important, but when it becomes racism, that center story 
is race. And everything that you see and identify your identity, your practice, everything is through the lens of race. Not through the gospel, not through the kingdom, not through scripture. Everything's through race. All right? Feminism. It's not gen gender is important. But when everything is seen through the lens of female, okay, things are going to get distorted. Same thing with nationalism. There's nothing wrong with being proud of, of our country, but it becomes a problem when that becomes the central story through which all other stories are interpreted by. Or politicism, when left or right becomes the dominant story. The story which, again, shapes all your other stories. Through which you understand and interpret scripture instead of the other way around. And individualism and materialism and hedonism and secular, they're all isms because they put at center, something other than Jesus Christ in the gospel of the story. And it's disastrous. It leads to malformation as disciples of Christ. All right, so this is where the faithful presence in the theme of Esther and with um, Ruth, where we're going to go, is what's our bigger story that we're holding on to? What's the bigger story that Esther and Mordecai are holding on to in this? Now we can see through this story, and we'll see through this story, and Ruth for that matter as well. But one thing, one, one big arching thing here we have to understand about the bigger story in Scripture, and I am really summarizing this now for the sake of time. Um, this is in Genesis 22, God speaking, Through your, as Abraham, offspring, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. He's speaking to Abraham and the future of the Jewish people, the nation, God's chosen people, and say, through you, I'm going to work my blessings to this entire world. That's a promise I'm making to you, Abraham. And they've seen it fulfilled in the nation of Israel, come to be, but then judged and overthrown by the Babylonians and by the Assyrians and by the Persians. And now they're scattered all over the place. And like, has God abandoned his promises? Was this just all a joke? Is this not happening anymore? Is God even present with us anymore? These are the questions that are at the foot of Esther and Mordecai. And will be at Ruth and Boaz and Naomi as well. So here it is. Here's the story in a nutshell of those first two chapters. There's three scenes that we saw. Okay, we saw that the opulence and the extravagance and the power and the little M majesty of King Xerxes through his half year long party with all his key folks and, and the army. That could be a hyperbole and exaggeration. I can't imagine partying for 180 days straight. <laughs> but maybe they did. Maybe they knew how to party. Some of us now. Some of us may have tried that. It doesn't work very well. In the end, he, and remember, he's drunk after the second party he throws for the city and for all those around. He wants his queen, his, can't really say wife, because there is other women involved in his life as well, but his queen to come forward. And he was going to pray her out there as just some dangling, take a look at my wife or my queen. This is a bunch of drunk guys. After seven days, do you think he had good intentions in mind? Do you think all the guys around there, drunk as well, had good intentions in mind? Absolutely not. This was not a cool thing to do. And Vashti knew it. And Vashti, man, she could have been executed on the spot for, for this. This is the courage of Vashti in a way, saying, I am not going to be created out there as some sex object for these people to look at. And she says, no. Okay, well, this ticks him off. And there's an edict from the other men who dislike what she did. And he said, well, man, other women can push back on the male and the, uh, the authority figure, which was the male at that time. So put out an edict that all women must be subject to the male. And the male should be master. And Vashti's banished. Okay, so that's the first thing. Vashti's banished. There's no queen right now. So that sets the stage for, okay, Xerxes needs the queen. The king needs to have the queen. 
And that's scene two, where Esther becomes queen. Now, Esther is a young, orphaned Jewish girl in a foreign land, in Persia. All right, she's taken in by Mordecai, her cousin, and raised by him. So he's obviously older than her. And she seems to be you know, a compliant, obedient young lady to Mordecai, listening to what he says and what he does. And we'll see that throughout the book as well. And she's beautiful, again, to look at. All right? And so the king decides to gather all the young women of marrying age. That's what it actually means to work at. All the women of marrying age. Of the 127 provinces, are you kidding me? This is, this is creating a harem far greater than King Solomon. We're talking thousands of women that were going to be brought in. Because it was all of them. All right? He was stripping the land of all the available young women for marriage to himself. And they weren't going back. They were going to remain part of that harem. We saw that in the story. They go to a second harem after the first. Right? So this is, this is a mind-boggling kind of scene. And Esther is chosen to go as well. Really kind of forced. Because if you didn't go, you're going to be killed. So she ends up going. And if you watch the Veggie Tales and the softened version of all this, I know you all have good special stuff here. You all have Veggie Tales in your mind going back here. I love how they play with that and bring it to the kids' level. And that this becomes a beauty pageant. This is not a beauty pageant. We all, we all know as adults, know the language in here. This was not a beauty pageant. This is the one who could please the king the most at night. That's what this was all about. All right? Now, in the midst of this, we've got to really get this. And i got to land this plane here pretty quick because I can go for a while. This is the heart of it right here. Hidden in this text in chapter 2 is our, one of our favorite words. One of my favorite words. The hugely important Hebrew word, said. Did you pick it up in there anywhere? It's not translated stand, steadfast love here. It's referred to Haggai, the one who's in charge of the harem, and the one that actually takes notice of Esther and brings her into a smaller little group of women that are favored. The one that's favored. That word favored there is just said. All right, and Xerxes, out of all the women, has has said toward Esther. Now, if you're a Jew and you're reading this, you're going to get blown away with this. What in the world is the word has said doing in this text? What's it doing here? This is a covenantal word that is used almost explicitly for God. And his covenantal love is eternal, unchanging, unbreakable, unconditional kind of love toward his people. And this is the way he describes himself in Exodus 34 to Moses. He said, I'm going to pass before you, and my steadfast love will pass before you. It's mentioned twice there as one of the key characters of the guys. What is this word doing in the middle of chapter 2, referring to Haggai and Xerxes? Let me tell you, this is God at work. This is God's faithful presence with Esther in the midst of this crisis that she finds herself in. It's had to be a crisis of faith for her. Doing these things as a Jew, breaking almost every law known to the Jews in this situation. Yet in the midst of this, she's finding favor. Really from Haggai and from Xerxes. Really, just coincidence that this happens. Now this is God's intervention God's has said coming in, God's favor toward his people, toward Esther, through Haggai and through Xerxes, is what he's saying. Haggai didn't drum this up, or, or Xerxes, this love, this favor toward Esther, God did. Because this is divine love. This is God's love. This is a beautiful, hidden, right in the middle of chapter 2. God's presence with Esther. All right, we're going to see that through the rest as well. So she becomes queen. Um, and at the very end there, we get you know, some of the final pieces moving into place for the rest of the, the story. We get this little side story that Mordecai, her cousin, overhears a plot to kill the king. 
and he kills Esther. Esther kills the king. Turns out to be true. Um, the king executes the, the two, and Mordecai gets written up in the annals and the, the logs of what has happened to the to the king. The Mordecai saved the king. That becomes very important later uh, in the story. All right, so understanding what's going on in the big story of Scripture, that God is at work saving his chosen people is fundamental to understanding what is going on here. Because God's presence is faithful. God said is there, even in a foreign land, in strange situations like this with Esther. All right? We, we, we said this at the very beginning of our service together. Psalm 115. Give glory to God. Why? For the sake of your has said. That's how powerful and beautiful and good God's has said. So to see it again in the midst of this, we're invited to see the bigger picture of what God is doing to save his people, which includes you and me, right? In and through Jesus Christ, who is God's faithful presence with us today, his beautiful faithful presence through the Holy Spirit, who has revealed who God really is, God's has said to his people, his redeeming love toward us, his covenant love toward us. So in this, ultimately we are to see the work of Christ and the presence of God for his people, even in crazy places like America and Oakdale and Ripon and Manteca and other places. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, in some ways this is a difficult story for us to navigate over 2,000 plus years ago. But Lord, help us through your Holy Spirit to see it through the bigger story, the story of your grace and your mercy, your redeeming love, your has said for your people. May we be aware of your presence in our lives even right now. That you're not just amongst us, that you're in us. And we've been united to Christ by grace through faith. This is the work of your Spirit. So Lord, may we have courageous faith as we're going to see with, with Esther and with Ruth. To live out our identity of who you are. May your story, your good news story, be our central story, our shaping story, the one that conforms us more in the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. His name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for hanging in there for, for that one. There's a lot of setup to, to those verses. We won't have to go with much of the setup for the next one. Although we will be reading the chapters, but they get a little bit shorter uh, as, as well. As we come to the communion table, we make the explicit connection between the sermon and the sacrament, uh, the means of grace here, that Christ is the ultimate revelation of God. This emphasizes the participation in Christ's part here, right? It certainly is a uh, remembering, a memorial of what God has done in and through Christ. But Christ is not dead. He's not just the crucified one. He's the risen one as well, the ascended one as well. Equally important. And so we celebrate this means of grace this morning, the presence of Christ in us and among us, continuing to shape us and feed us and nourish us together for his glory.